So these charts can be these charts can be built as well using a spreadsheet. This is a simple example of how to build a heptogram with the with a spreadsheet. We just need to put the values in the cells, and then every spreadsheet has a feature called conditional formatting, which takes the value of that's present in the cell, and it applies a certain format to that cell depending on the value of that particular cell. So in this case, for example, I have built a really simple one that uh, that shows numbers from 1 to 28. And then I applied conditional formatting to this set. So the spreadsheet detects that the range goes from 1 to 28. And then it applies a different gradient of colors, in my case, from red to blue, so that each cell is filled with a different color on the gradient based on the content. The last temporal visualization I wanted to show you is what we have called the chronogram. This is a plot I developed during my PhD, and it kind of gathers all the temporal plots into a single image. A chronogram can be a bit overwhelming at first. So in order to understand it better, let me show you how it's built theoretically before showing an actual chronogram. In this case, the chronogram is also a circular plot where the angle represents a day of the year, beginning from the top, which represents January 1st, and going clockwise. This time, the radius represents a year, or better said, the difference between a year and the reference year, which will be the center of the plot. We have been using this 1750 as center for this plot because we believe that any record that was collected before Linnaeus developed the binomial nomenclature is probably at least doubtful. Density of records, in this case, is represented using a cold, hot color gradient. So dark blue points represent fewer records, and red, red, red color represents uh, more dense points. So here it is. This plot shows all the temporal information from a Spanish data publisher. And we can see several patterns here. Remember that each of these points is a complete date, a unique combination of day, month, and year. And the color represents record density. So we have uh, days such as these ones in red with a lot of records, and days such as these ones here in dark blue with very few records. So the four, we can detect here four different patterns. The first one, I'll start with is this one. This is actually not a, a problem with the data. This is a plot feature. Here, each point appear, each point is separated by three, three layers of points. I mean, this, this, here, each point appears once every four times. So that's February 29 which only happens once every four years. So that's not an issue with the data. That's a normal way of plot of using this plot. What's not natural of the plot is this line here. This line is the January 1st line, which is more dense than the other days in the surroundings. And it represents the same that, that I was explaining with the heptogram. In this case, it's uh, these records here are probably not intended to show a whole date, a whole day, month, and year date. They show the year, and that's why they appear in different points in the radius. But they are not intended to show the complete date. They probably have uh, empty values for day and year. Then the data management system, or the database, uh, applies a certain default value to fill those, because the system would need to put some values there. The another pattern that we can see is that this area here, oops, this area here, is in general of a more red color than this area here. That means in spring and summer, there are more records, or at least there is a higher sampling effort than in winter. This is the same as what as was happening as what was happening with the heptogram. 
And the last one is this ring here. There's a lower density ring here. This is actually a historical issue. These are the years of the Spanish Civil War, where, where science was not that important. Efforts of the government efforts and money efforts were put in somewhere else. So how do we build these chronograms? Well, although it might be surprising, chronograms can also be created using Excel. The main thing is to transform the day of the year into an angle, and then calculate the, uh, the vertical and horizontal components of that angle, and then build a, build a scatter plot, a simple XY plot with these components. I'll show you how it works with an example. Let's take the 1st of March 1995. In a year that has 366 days, the 1st of March is day number 61. Now we just need to transform that into an angle. If December 31st is the last day of the year, it will also be the last point in the circle with an angle of 360. So if we do a simple transformation, we get that the 1st of March forms a 60 degree angle with the vertical. Then we apply basic trigonometry so that we can extract the vertical and horizontal components of the point. And thus we almost get the x and the y of our point. We do have x and y values, but they will only work if the circle had a radius of 1. We still need to make the distance to the center proportional to the year. In order to do that, we just need to multiply the sine and cosine times the difference between the year of the point, 1995, and our reference value, 1750. So the sine of 60 is 0.866 times the difference between our year and the reference year gives approximately 212. And that's the x value of our point. On the other hand, the cosine of 60 degrees is 0.5 times 245, which is the difference between these two years, it gives 122.5, which is the y value of our, uh, of our point. So now we can use a scatter, you can plot these x, y values in a scatter plot, and repeating that for the rest of the points, we'll get something like this. In the end, a chronogram is really similar to a huge spiral starting from the center and going clockwise, where each year adds a layer of points, so to speak. Now I'll move on to taxonomic representations, and I will show you one visualization that's very useful for this kind of information. It's called a tree map. Tree maps are nested tile plots, meaning they are a group of tiles, and each one of those tiles contains children tiles, and it's contained by a parent tile. This makes it great for visualizing hierarchical relationships between values, such as taxonomic hierarchies. In our tree maps, the size of the tile depends on what we want to represent. If it's a purely taxonomic tree map, the size of the tile is proportional to the number of children taxa. On the other hand, if we are dealing with a taxonomic content analysis, like when exploring a collection, then the size of the tile can be proportional to the number of records for that taxa. So, for example, the tile of the animals will be larger than the tile of plants if the collection has more animal records than plant records. We can add another dimension and represent it with different colors. In this example, colors are just shown to stress the difference between kingdoms. Animals in red, plants in light blue, fungi in green, and so on. But colors can be used to represent any other feature. To have a good tree map, each and every record must have a full taxonomic hierarchy, not only species name. But it's precisely because of this that this plot can also be used with incomplete taxonomies. If any record or group of records is missing any taxonomic level, the available names will either uh, will either contain or be contained by tiles without any name, 
or remained empty. This plot can also be used to see if any taxonomic group has a strangely high or low number of children taxa, or a strangely high or low number of records. One of our experiments showed that this can also be used to detect problems related to homonymy. We were exploring a plant collection, and suddenly we found that there were many tiles that showed the taxonomic hierarchy of insects. We investigated a bit further and found that the higher taxonomic levels had been filled automatically from the genus name, a plant genus that had a homonym among insects. So the mechanism took the right genus but the wrong taxonomy. This plot is a bit more difficult to build with a spreadsheet, but it's not impossible. It just requires more time. Take a spreadsheet and make make all cells square. Then select an area and calculate number of cells. Like for example here we have taken this area and we have calculated the number of cells. There are 10 rows by 10 columns. We have 100 cells. Then we build a proportion rule that relates the number of cells with the total number of records for taxonomic names. Here we have a total of 200 records. So the relationship would be this one here. If we want to represent records as cells, we have to use half the number of cells than the number of records. So animals will get 75 cells because there are 150 records in total. Chordates will have 50 because there are 100 records and so on. And then it's just a matter of selecting individual areas which contain that number of cells and delimit the area somehow, visually, with cell borders. Painting the background of the cells helps, helps differentiating the different groups. So in this case, animals take 75 cells and plants take only 25. But within animals, we have chordates with 100 cells, uh, sorry, with 50 cells and insects with 25 cells. It's pretty much like building a huge puzzle. So far I've shown you that you can build almost any type of visualization with a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are a quite convenient way of doing this because you have the data and the plots in the same place. And besides, they don't really require in-depth knowledge. Just spend a bit of time. But there are definitely other tools that help building these visualizations. One of those tools is Google Charts API. This is a tool I like a lot, and it's especially useful if we want to make visualizations interactive and web-based, such as the case of a dashboard. Google Charts is, in fact, a JavaScript API developed by Google. It's just a set of functions written in the JavaScript programming language. And these functions interact with the data the user puts into the scripts. It requires a bit of knowledge on JavaScript and web programming, but the reward is that it allows you to easily build interactive visualizations. All you need to do is build the HTML page and provide the data that the API will use to draw the charts. There is also a way of directly interacting with the functions that build the visualizations without having to touch the code once the web page is built. Google Charts makes it easy to build a set of controllers to filter the data that's shown on the fly, like, like a slider to select a range of years. This is just a silly example they have put in their web page to show con how controllers work. But if you go to this URL down here, that's the page where they document how to use controllers. And you can try them and see how the plots change on the fly. All these features make Google Charts uh, ideal for building dashboards, such as the one we saw earlier from the Atlas of Living Australia. Certainly, they can also be used to detect patterns, but they are more oriented towards easing the interpretation of a group of records. In fact, this tree map, this one here, this has been built with the Google Charts API. I, I didn't use a spreadsheet to do this one, although it, it could be possible very time-consuming, but possible. So apart from that, many of the widely used programming languages have any sort of visualization building framework. 
The one I have been working with more closely is R, which has some powerful features to build plots and visualizations. In this case, it's it's required to have stronger programming skills. But the good thing is that with those frameworks, you can do almost whatever you want. Besides, R is a data analysis environment. So it's a similar situation that with the spreadsheets, where you have the data and the visualization environment in the same place, able to interact automatically. R, however, has more powerful analysis and visualization capabilities which compensates the extra effort one has to put when to overcome learning how to use it. This screenshot shows the actual code I used to generate the mammals of the Kenya map, if you remember from the uh, previous slide. So you can see that in less than 10 lines of code, we can build maps such, such as this one. And in general, the, ba the basic visualizations can be built with a little piece of, with a really, really small piece of code. And the last scenario I want to show you, and I will finish the talk with this one, is the use of a complete framework specially designed to visualize certain aspects of the primary biodiversity records. The one tool I will briefly show you is called Map of Life. Map of Life is a web platform that provides a whole framework for the visualization of geospatial information. The idea behind it is to create an application to build custom maps to represent information about a species on a single common environment, merging the different sources of geospatial data. Among these sources, we can find occurrence points from GBIF, spread expert range maps from the IUCN, local checklists and inventories, and some others. This union of different types of data makes it possible to apply new kinds of analysis and to detect new trends. And for example, in this screenshot, we can see the distribution map for the Pyrenees and Desman, or a rodent from the Pyrenees. And along with the distribution map, we can see the occurrence points extracted from GBIF. With this setup, we can now see how many occurrence points fall inside the range map, and how many points fall outside of the range map. Thus, we are adding a layer of quality control to the records. Without the range maps, we could only say that the records are likely to be right. But now we can add a level of certainty to our decision. So that's basically what I wanted to say today about visualizations. Thank you, everyone, for being there. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, I guess, Tom, we can start the round of questions. Right? Thank you, Javier. Um, and sorry about whatever the technological problem was, because that ended up removing a lot of our visitors, viewers. Um, but thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I had some questions. Um, one of them is, I remember that you had come up with a very interesting problem with dates in the management of the very large data sets within GBIF. Yep. Can you tell us a bit about that and how how these data exploration exercises helped you uh, see that. Okay. So this was actually a pretty serious issue with the dates in GBIF. And we solved it by using the chronogram. Uh, we found that um, we found that with some publishers the chronogram showed a, a strange pattern, which was a series of uh, heavily dense radii, all equidistant, exactly 12 radii, all equidistant, representing the last day, the, the last day of, the, of the previous month, and one especially, which was the 29th of November. So we we did a bit of exploration on the content of those data sets, and we found that between the original data from the publishers and the data that was available through GBIF, the, uh, the days were different and the year were, was different as well. So what happened here is that uh, those records that had no month or day were interpreted in a slightly wrong way. Uh, so let me. Well, and I can show you an example, but let me uh, 
let me uh, yeah explain an example. So for example, we had the year 1990 without month and without day. What the GB uh, mechanism was doing was it was taking the absence of month or the zero in the month and it was interpreting that as the last month of the previous year. So the year changed from 1990 to 1989 and the month changed from zero or empty to 12. And then it did the same with the year, with the, um, with the day. It took the day zero or no and it interpreted that as the last day of the previous month. So it took 11 and changed it to, uh, it took 12 and changed it to 11, and then it took 0 and put 30, which was the last day of November. So the original date, which was year 1990 and month and year and day empty, became 1989, November 30. So a lot of records that weren't supposed to be plotted in the chronogram actually got plotted in the November 30 line. That's what happened and that's how we detected it. So we communicated the, this issue to GBIF and they are, I believe they are uh, on the way of solving that right now. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, one last question. Go back to your introduction. Should we be waiting to serve biodiversity data until we have the data perfect? Or could we get them out there, get them integrated with the broader corpus of biodiversity data at our earliest opportunity? I'm more of the way of thinking that we should share everything while making sure that people understand that it's not exactly, that it, it might not be right. But if we keep the data for ourselves, then it's just us who is looking for the for issues in the data. But if we make it open, openly accessible for everyone, then there's, then everyone could potentially take a look at that and see if there's something wrong there. So in the end, I think there's a, there's a better gain in sharing the data and in showing what's there, even if it's wrong. Because, yeah, that's, I think that's the way of, of moving forward faster than keeping the data for you. Okay. Well, Javier, many, many thanks for your time this morning. Uh, I know it's fairly early morning for where you are in the world. Um, but thank you very much on behalf of the, the dozens of people who are watching you. Um, I will get the YouTube links fixed, merged, and back online uh, so that people can watch the entire seminar. And to the broader audience, um, thank you for tuning in. And I will hope to see you on May 29th, again, when Jorge Velasquez from Colombia will be, will be speaking about map annotation. So thanks again, Javier. Thank you very much, Don, and thank you, everybody.